All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the second day of September in the year of our Lord, 2023. Uh, I, I, see, I just noticed, uh, uh, do not wear shirts, clothing with lots of fine lines in it, straight lines especially, uh, if on a digital camera, especially if it doesn't have an anti-aliasing filter, a.k.a. blur filter. Uh, they tend to not use those nowadays uh, because that's what it does. It blurs the image. So whether you want <laughs> resolution or you want uh, to avoid this, screens, that, that kind of stuff really is a problem. But it's, so if, I'm sorry, I, excuse me for the distraction. I didn't realize that would be there. Uh, it happens. It happens. Uh, if I had a really poor, maybe YouTube compression muddles it enough that you won't see it. Uh, I see, I actually got rainbow striping right here. Wow, that's interesting. Diffraction. Okay, uh, away from the physics of God's creation and the side effects of it when, when it interacts with man's digital stuff. Uh, I'm not going to say digital is a blessing. Computers aren't really a blessing. The only good that's come out of them is it's enabled the gospel to go out, but I sometimes wonder from what I see on the Internet, uh, how, it's, it seems to be more the vomit of Satan than it is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, wow. It's just awful. And all the people that are not now, the latest speculation, of course, is Christ going to return September 24th. On Yom Kippur. Well, why not on the day of trumpets, which is what? I don't know. Ten days earlier than that? So that'd be like the, what, the 14th? Around the 14th? But the Jews fudge their calendar anyway, depending on whether it occurs on a Sabbath. Paul tells us, you know, we're, we're instructed in the New Testament, that you know, the, the idea that we should follow seasons and times and those kind of things is uh, basically condemned. It's, it's not... It's it's weakness. It's it's uh, the. Um, it can be dangerous if you start thinking that you're righteous because you keep Old Testament Mosaic commandments. You hold to the system, the covenant that is no longer in force and was only temporary anyway rather than the covenant that Jesus purchased with his own blood, which is eternal. So, uh, but they will be shown to be wrong like everybody else. Uh, Jesus said, what did Jesus say? They keep ignoring. Of course, a lot of these people are charismatics and regard themselves as prophets, which is probably a one-way ticket to hell, uh, unless they repent. See, they... The, uh, the and really this has to be pointed to um, John Wesley because he uh, his idea of authority not resting solely on scripture but including reason and, and tradition and especially experience he was a flake he did not have a stable Christian life that's what I mean flaky he was he was unstable, he was double-minded, and he introduced all kinds of doctrines that are contrary to Scripture, manifestly contrary. Uh, entire sanctification, uh, uh, Christian perfectionism, these, these are very destructive satanic doctrines. And uh, not only the holiness movement, and of course some of these movements, uh, 
picked up and amplified his aberrant doctrines rather than his biblical doctrines. Not everything he was see the. Not everything he said was terrible. That's the problem. People say, "Well, just eat the meat and spit out the bones." Well, no, you'll eat the meat and choke on the bones. They'll kill you. Uh, it doesn't work like that. You take the nobody in the right mind uh, eats some meat with the bones in it. You take that out. You don't so try to swallow the bones. <clears throat> People die from that sometimes. Okay, so, uh, but that now he's not the only one that that doesn't hold the scripture alone, of course. But th that his teaching and his doctrine was picked up by the holiness movement, which were his followers. This is uh, a ri revivalism of original Wesleyanism. And they were looking for personal holiness. Wesley at times and his followers taught, we stand before God in our own righteousness, not in Christ's righteousness. Wesley hated the idea of imputed righteousness, which makes him an utter heretic, really. Just like uh, uh, Charles Finney in the 19th century. He taught exactly the same thing, even though he was not a Wesleyan uh, he was in the holiness movement uh, and a major influence in the so-called Second Great Awakening, which was a great darkening. Uh, it was a false Christianity that was being presented. So if, if you think you're going to stand before God in your deeds, in your holiness, your toast, your absolute toast, you've already rejected the gospel. It is what Christ did for us on the cross. It is his righteousness we stand in, and if you're not standing in him, you're lost. You're not saved, because you have to be in him to be saved by faith. All right, so uh, what I want to talk about is the uh, like more, the, because there's huge confusion, and it goes back, well, really, they had this in the first century to a degree. Uh, it goes way back. Uh, whether you call it institutional Christianity or, Con or uh, Constantinian Christianity or state Christianity or sacramental Christianity, there, it's all related. It, it is the Christianity of man, not the Christianity of God in Christ. So let's, uh, what's the difference? Well, it's what I grew up in was the, the institutional thing. And it was a mixture. Uh, uh, Lutheranism, it's got this bipolar disorder. It can't decide whether salvation is by grace through faith in Christ, and that alone, or whether it's by sacraments through the church. It is completely bipolar, and there's this just confusion in Lutheranism. Uh, it's just bad confusion. Uh, it's not so present in Catholicism because the the gospel's not there in Catholicism. So you have, on the one hand you've got the real gospel, and the other hand you've got uh, the sacramental state church system, because Lutheranism was a state church. And when they came to America, they still kept that form. Uh, some Lutherans eventually came to realize it's not biblical, and that was like the Evangelical Free Church and others that came out. See, until recently, I don't know, it's probably still the state church in Norway. I don't think they've ever, what do they call when you, uh, disestablishment, uh, deestablished Lutheranism as a state religion. And, of course, uh, that they are fully woke, they are fully uh, conformed to the world. Women ministers, nobody attends the Lutheran Church, the state Lutheran Church in Norway, practically no one, just like the Anglican Church. Who goes to that in England? Most Anglican churches have been turned into nightclubs or mosques or something because nobody goes to them. And they're supported by the state, and the head of the Anglican Church is King Charles. 
that notable Christian King Charles. The adulterer King Charles. The royal family, aren't they a, a picture of Christian holiness and true Christian morality? One could ask the question, what does King Charles have to do with Christ? And I think the answer is pretty clear. You could answer the same question about Donald Trump, by the way. And Biden, there's not even a question. Oh, man. You know, they're, they're in, in your face. You know, where, where is the evidence of regeneration? And that's the difference. Regenerate Christianity, born-again Christianity, versus man-made Christianity. So first of all, let's look at an, an unusual reference to born-again, but uh, we'll go to Matthew 11. Verse 27, starting there. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Christ is the one mediator between God the Father and man, or God and man. He is the mediator. And he is the savior of humanity. Those that come to him. So he says in verse 28, come to me. He doesn't say come to my church. He says come to me. Come to an institution. Go to the temple and offer sacrifices. No, he says come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. If you labor under the conviction of your sins, He's the answer. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Comparing himself to the law, he's saying the law was called the yoke. And the yoke, coming under the yoke of the commandments, the law of Moses is a burden. It's heavy. No one can bear it. The only people that bear that are the ones that turn the law into the, the minor things like tithing the, mil, the mint and dill in your garden. Things like that. You know, the, the, the insignificant, not our relatively insignificant parts of the law, instead of the, the center of the law, which is love of God and love of your neighbors. See, you can, you can do the, the details, and you can do those in hypocrisy because you're not doing them out of love. The external, visible things you can do. But you cannot keep the law because you can't keep the, the heart of the law because you're a sinner, dead in trespasses and sins. And the law is a heavy burden for a dead man. You don't have the strength to carry it. A ghost. <sighs> but Jesus says his yoke is easy and his burden is light. There are people that try to make Christianity into a burden. They make it a heavy load. Um, I suggest you not listen to them. Because it's... God who works in his people both to will and to do his good pleasure. If 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 it's a if it's a burden, if what you're being told you have to do is a burden, it is if it's difficult, it's not you're not being uh, led by the spirit of God. You're not walking in the truth in Christ because Christ carries the load. Yeah, it's it's not it's but do you notice here again in this text it's he says come to me personally not come to a doctrine but come to him it doesn't say seek out a pastor he says come to him it is a personal relationship that God calls you into in Christ 
That is Christianity. It is a real living relationship, far more profound than any relationship on earth, and it is a relationship with God himself. And we become literally the children of God, begotten of God. Now, we're still in this mortal body in this life, and we have this problem within us. We are uh, bipolar. <laughs> Uh, we we have the we still have the body of flesh and sin dwells in this mortal body. Uh, we still have the the temptations toward self centeredness and pleasing ourselves and and all that goes with the flesh. But we also have the spirit that does not sin. A, a new spirit, a new heart, a new creation within us, begotten of God, and the spirit of God Himself dwelling in us. So uh, we're no longer of the flesh, of Adam of Satan, of this world. We're of God if you've been born again, but uh, we also have this, this uh, the flesh is still with us while we're in this mortal body and the problems of it. So we have this internal wrestling that goes on, some, especially when you're, uh, especially sometimes in our lives, hopefully uh, as, you, as you get more integrated into the gospel and see the flesh, the devil uses sin and fear uh, to uh, to manipulate Christians, and immature Christians are you know, can be dominated by the flesh, even though they're born again. You're a baby Christian in an adult, sinful, wicked body, maybe, with all the habits that go uh, that have been accumulated over your life, and even two-year-olds can be very wicked. Very, just look at how they treat one another sometimes squabble over you know they'll they'll smack another kid in the face over a toy even though they got a pile of toys just watch children sometime uh, and you'll see that if you're born again christian you'll recognize that's the flash that's what they're born into and it does manifest itself very early even before two unfortunately sometimes uh Adults think that stuff is cute. Bad idea. Oh, they're just children. Yeah, no, they're just being sinners, which is what they're born into. Yes, the original sin is that self-centeredness, that the lack of the Spirit of God in you, that lack of relationship with God that we must have to be, recon you know, be reconciled to God and enter into the relationship he has. That's with God personally. If your Christianity isn't with God himself in Christ, not just the doctrine of that, but the fact of that, as Paul says, if you don't know that the Spirit of Christ is in you, if you don't have that, if you don't, well, he said, don't you recognize that? And then he said, if any man does not have the Spirit, now, whether a person necessarily recognizes that, especially right uh, right away, but you will over time. You'll recognize it. And you know, I, I do not wish like the idea that we point to an event called born again as if it is some experiential thing. It's entering into Christ. It's it is receiving Christ by faith. The born-again thing is God's work, not ours, and his work is in the Spirit, and the flesh cannot see the Spirit. So to uh, burden people with the idea that they had to experience something, the same thing as the preacher experienced or something, or some dramatic conversion experience. People have had dramatic experiences from the devil. People have had dramatic experiences and, and, and abandoned Christ. The Mormons ex preach an experiential salvation, a burning in your bosom that might have been caused by pizza. Who knows? Too many jalapenos. That is not biblical. Mormons are antichrist. Antichrist is not an individual. Just look up the word and see how it's used. 
in the Bible. It's only used by the Apostle John five times. That's it. Not used by Paul. Not used by Jesus. It's only used by the Apostle Paul. It doesn't even appear in the book of Revelation, which was written by John. Well, actually, it was dictated to John. <laughs> it was a series of visions. He, Christ called him uh, up for a conference. Oh, boy, is that book turned upside down. Why is it that so-called Bible-believing Christians spiritualize the literal in the book of Revelations and literalize the spiritual? The five letters to the five churches, those were literally five or seven churches, seven letters to seven churches. Where did I get five from? I don't know. Those were literal letters that John was told to write to seven literal churches. Not seven church ages. That is a total fabrication. Why do these people who insist on being literal leaders of the Bible, which I do, literal when it's intended to be literal, why do they take what is intended to be literal and turn it into some system that is not, it's not teaching that at all? And then they take visions, which are by nature uh, spiritual and symbolic and not literal, generally, They're not communicated that way, and they turn that into literal truth. Like, you, you're supposed to take this like like a, a great red dragon and uh, a, a beast rising up out of the sea. Those are literal. Okay. Sounds like Godzilla or something. That is not how you understand it. And if, if somebody is trying to, you know, if somebody is saying that the, the seven church ages, they're dispensationalists. Right there, that 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 is telling evidence of that. Now there are worse systems in dispensationalism, like amillennialism, postmillennialism, all kinds of nonsense like that. Uh, the early church apparently generally believed in what's called today historic premillennialism, that Christ will return before the millennium. The early church didn't believe in a pre-tribulational rapture. Believe in a rapture not a secret rapture that was invented in the early 19th century. If it wasn't part of God's revelation from the beginning, it's not part of God's revelation, the beginning of the church. If it's not from that, if it's not revealed by the apostles in the New Testament, it's not true. All this added stuff, all these prophecies that occur today, they are all false unless they're simply recapitulating what the scripture teaches. Which is what a pastor is supposed to be doing. To speak forth what God has already revealed, because the scripture is sufficient for every good work for the man of God. If you don't believe that, well, you don't believe the scripture. And you don't know God, because He testifies of these things. Who is, who who told you know? Here's you don't you don't believe Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit. Paul the apostle. Which is why Pentecostalism and the Charismatic movement is built on a lie, because it is not and Methodism. <laughs> uh, but the, it is does not restrict itself to God's solid revelation in Scripture. It has always embraced extra-biblical revelation. So does Roman Catholicism, by the way. That's why Roman, Catholic, Roman Catholicism was a fertile seedbed for the charismatic movement. From the beginning of it, of the charismatic movement, where the charismatic movement, the Pentecostal movement, jumped from the wrong side of the tracks churches, the the holiness churches, where it came up in, and the you know that was not accepted by 
Christians, either mainline or Bible-believing Christians, or you know, none of them would accept it. And then it jumped over in the Anglican Church in California uh, in the 1960s into Anglicanism and spread from there. Of course, Anglicanism was dead, so it was a you know, a dead Christianity has no immune system. It already really rejected Christ. It wasn't uh, uh, rejected the fundamentals of, you know, fundamental doctrines of, of Christ. Of course Satan had a home there. It was easy for them to swallow it. And as evangelicalism has disintegrated, it has spread places even into places like the Southern Baptists. The recent, one of the recent uh, presidents of that organization that served multiple terms because he canceled the election because of the pandemic and just appointed himself again. Lawless, lawless individuals. Uh, he was uh, uh, a closet charismatic. John Piper uh, said he didn't speak in tongues, but sure wanted to. <laughs> all these, you know, these people are all and, and I, I'm disturbed. I see all these young people on YouTube with their dreams and prophecies. They've been misled. They've been misled. It's a, it's, a, it's a terrible shame. They have been shown the wrong way by their churches, by their pastors, who themselves are corrupted by this stuff. The charismatic movement is even worse than Pentecostalism. Of course, a lot of Pentecostalism is not even Trinitarian, so they're, I mean, they're not even on the same board. So, uh, but what we have in the world, we have this substitute for the real Christian, real Christianity with real salvation, which is, you know, Jesus said, come on to me, this personal relationship that is wrought by God in us. We are called to him, and then... However you want to figure this, there's no way to figure out exactly the dynamics of this out. Faith, our faith is involved, but our faith is transformed too. Uh, and I don't want to preach my experience, but my experience conforms to what the Scripture says. Not, not the details of it so much, but the. Uh, it wasn't until I cast myself, I gave up on trying to become a Christian or trying to do what would please God, trying to to be born again, trying to find whatever this was I knew was lacking in my life because I was a manifest sinner, even though I was baptized as an infant, well, sprinkled as an infant, although I don't think that is an important distinction at all anyway. It's not really relevant. Uh, water does not save you, but this, this bipolar disease in Lutheranism among conservative Lutherans, I don't even consider the ELCA. They're just apostates, children of Satan, and manifestly so. Uh, because, it, you know, the people that, people will cling to their religion even when, when it is obviously that the, it's a religion of, that's controlled by Satan and he's dragging you all to hell. People are afraid to leave. Their fear that they simply are afraid to leave because of family connections and everything else. Uh, took me, my, my parents stayed with that stuff for years. It didn't start that way when they became, when they were Lutherans, but it went that way because it is not true Christianity. You, you can have true Christians there, and there's, this, there's Luther's doctrine of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, which is true, but it's like this bipolar thing, and they're not compatible with each other, just like this, the flesh and the spirit in us isn't. And you, you grow up, with the assumption that you're born again because you were sprinkled. Baptismal regeneration is part of Lutheranism, even though it's contrary. You know, there, you have this, this opposites in Luther and 
What can I say? God help Lutherans. It's not only Lutherans. This is present in Protestantism generally. Slightly less so in Calvinism, because Calvinism doesn't emphasize generally the sacraments as much. Lutheranism takes the sacraments just as seriously as Roman Catholicism is. Lutheranism is just halfway Protestant, halfway Catholic. Double-minded. Calvinism has even greater problems. Because, but they also hold to a, a very insufficient view of salvation. They, they are doctrinally closer to it, but experientially farther away, I think. It is, uh, it, well, of course, it's all based on predestination there, whether you're of the elect or not. If you're of the elect, you're going to be saved no matter what, period. Uh, it isn't biblical either. Uh, Anglicanism, Roman Catholicism without the Pope, uh, just pretty much like Lutheranism. Uh, I'm talking about high church Anglicanism. There's there's an evangelical Anglican, Angli, uh, Anglical, Ang now I can't say it, evangelical Episcopalianism. <laughs> But they are double-minded, too. They don't know quite, you know, it's like a born-again Christian staying in the Lutheran church. It's like, eh. it's not consistent with the gospel. It is mixed, thoroughly mixed, and it is by its nature. Institutional Christianity, you go back to Constantine and then uh, shortly after Constantine, uh, you have the official establishment of Christ of a form of Christianity as the one and only religion of the Roman Empire, and everything else will be suppressed. But in order to get all the people into the into that church and religion, the religion can't be original Christianity because the original Christianity is a personal relationship with God and only God can give that to you. Only God can call you into that. It can't be done by men. It can't be done by, by priesthoods and ordinances and sacraments and laws, which is what man can do. The external thing. So you have a, a, a hollowed-out Christianity that, that is compatible with the world and the systems of this world and unregenerate people. It's a, it's a system of Christianity that unregenerate people can, can be part of. It might have certain social values, but they can't actually reconcile you with God. And so at its heart, it's always deceptive because it's not of Christ. You have the, the outer appearances. You have the, the sacraments. You have the scriptures. So you, God has a witness there, but it's a witness that you need to be saved into of what, what the reality is. Um, so it's, it's not liberalism. It's not utterly apostate, but it's not the real thing. You know, it has it has elements of Christian doctrine, but not the substance of genuine Christianity, which is you must be born again. You must have this personal relationship with God. That He must create a new you. There must be a new spirit in you. There must be a new heart in you. His, his spirit must reside in you. Only God can do these things. And he does it unmediated. It's you are his workmanship created in Christ. It's all tied up with Jesus. 
the God-man. His work. His atonement. And it's not mediated to you through an institution. He is the sole mediator between God and man. And that's the distinction. That's why state... Now, the Protestantism, they were all state churches. Orthodoxy, state churches. Catholicism is uh, the Pope took over from the kings. It's like Anglicanism, uh, uh, Henry VIII, he decided, no, I think the king should be charged with the church so I can grant myself a divorce. Yeah. But none of that, all those structures, all those institutions, none of that is biblical Christianity. It has some shadows of Christianity in it, but it's not. It's really more like Old Testament Judaism because it's a system of priesthood, sacrifices, uh, continuing sacrifices that don't actually take away your sin because it's only in Christ through faith. You have to, and it is... Uh, they, they can talk about being born again, but it's mediated through the sacraments, through the sacrament of baptism. Or, or baptism plus confirmation. Because even though those uh, denominations realize that there's something not quite sufficient in infant baptism. But confirmation doesn't do it either. Teaching people some doctrine does not make you... Uh, and then laying hands on you to receive the Holy Spirit from a dead, unregenerate priest or pastor or bishop isn't it. Human beings cannot do God's work, especially unregenerate human beings. So this is, you know, and all these things, like Catholicism, for example, lays heavy burdens on you. And they assure you that they are the uh, the ark of God, the salvation of God, the means to God's salvation. Only the church has uh, can mediate the grace of God to you through the sacraments. Man-made. Not biblical. Not biblical. And uh, true Christians look to the scripture because scripture is God inspired rather than what man does you find people that are but the flesh even in Christians born again Christians we tend especially when we're immature to still gravitate toward the flesh and toward what other people say toward Christian books rather than the scripture Christian authorities rather than the scripture we have to grow up. We have to grow up. So, if your Christianity is a heavy burden, you're doing something wrong. If if uh, if 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 going to church is a burden, there might be something wrong there. It was, and it might take you a while to realize it, but it's like you should. Why? Why is it so much of a burden? Am, am I, am I uh, not where I should be right now? Am I? Have I grown cold to Christ, and that I don't want to hear Christ, Christ crucified, preached? Or is it the fact that I'm not hearing Christ and Christ crucified preached at church? Is that why I'm growing uncomfortable there? Uh, that's a good question to to be uh, to keep in mind. Are you sliding back into the, the, the allowing the flesh to... Uh, are you walking in the flesh and therefore uncomfortable in in the church? Or are you walking in the spirit and are therefore uncomfortable, un, <laughs> uncomfortable in the church? So, but there's this, this radical distinction between the, the church, God's kingdom, and the kingdoms of this world, the, the flesh, uh, Adam, the kingdom of Satan, which is the world system. That's his kingdom. The scripture teaches that. But 
the institutional church and carnal Christianity, which may often all, not necessarily is unregenerate, but is dominated by the flesh, wants to blur that distinction. Neo-evangelicalism, Billy Grahamism, and you know that the came of not just him but others. Uh, post World War II, the new evangelical movement, going away from the separatism of the fundamentalism, which was just, I mean, there's a lot of distortion in the fundamentalism uh, because Satan puts his people, you know, if, if anything's of God, Satan will try to pollute it. And he did. He, bringing in entertainers and all kinds of, the, bringing in the revivalism uh, that was. Uh, Baptists have this problem in America. Uh, some, a lot of the roots are actually in revivalism, which whew, not biblical. There's no revivalism in the Bible. Man-made, man-made, uh, man-made traditions. But the uh, the safety net of institutional Christianity, Southern Baptist, a cultural, that's a cultural Christianity. It is uh, a Christianity where um, you can be comfortable in the world. As long as you follow certain things. It's like holiness movement. You can be very worldly as long as you keep the holiness code. And tithe. Oh, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. You know, all these man made rules that if you know the scriptures, you know what the scriptures teach. If you follow the scriptures, you're going to be an outlier almost everywhere. We are not of this world. If you're born again, you're no longer of the world. You're in the world, but you're not of it. We're strangers and aliens. And when you're aware of this, you start feeling like a stranger and alien. Look around us today, brothers and sisters. Don't you feel like you're a stranger in the wrong place? Like you went through the wrong door and suddenly found yourself in a, in a bar full of vomiting college students? Ugh. A memory just came to mind. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you have you ever done that, found yourself in the wrong place? No, I don't belong here. And that's our situation on earth. God has left us here as his witnesses. And that's why I'm, I, I do not believe the Bible teaches a pre-trib rapture possible, I suppose, but the Bible doesn't teach it. So when that becomes a test of whether you're a Bible believer or not, know that it's a man-made doctrine and not from Scripture. A lot of the, uh, the fun, what the dispensationalism teaches traditionally, because it's a tradition now, uh, it's only 200 years old, but all these graphs and charts and arrows of up, down, whatever, and uh, that's the multiple comings of Christ. It's like, oh, th this is, if you need a chart to explain it, <laughs> it comes with graphics. One of the people that was involved in it was a, uh, a draftsman, so he was a graphics artist. No, Th those are the teachings of men. Get your doctrine from what God says and teaches in the Scripture. What he teaches! Because they'll always have a pocket full of verses taken out of context. And they'll, they'll rattle those off, and most people don't ever go back and check the context and see if it's actually saying that. And they know that. Or they, just, they were taught this themselves. They think it's. And most pastors that teach this stuff have been taught it themselves uh, by their pastors in their churches and in the Bible college or seminary they went to. And they just rattle it off and they think it's the truth. 
They're not rattling off what they believe to be lies. They think it's the truth. They haven't actually checked it against Scripture. They seldom do these things, unfortunately. Are these doctrines that I've, I've believed and teach actually taught in Scripture? Or am I just passing on false teachings? Which is what Bible colleges and seminaries exist to do. Pass on denominational teachings. By definition, denominal, de denominational teachings are not the teachings of Scripture, because then everyone would believe it. It wouldn't be a denomination anymore. You know, they, they, like Baptists talk about Baptist distinctives, and I say Baptists ought not have distinctives. We should be Christians. Christian, instead of sectarians, sects have distinctions. Christ has one church, and we should have his doctrines and those alone. If you follow the doctrines of man, then you have denominations, sex, all kinds of weird things. But the but because the this evolution of the Christianity into the you know not real Christianity, but the uh, as Christianity became more and more carnal, more and more sacramental over the first several centuries, uh, more focused on the teaching of men, and less focused on Scripture. Of course, they didn't have Bibles individually normally. Uh, and I mean, you, you read the writings of those people and it's like, they're not scripture oriented. They just aren't. And you, you can see this progression away from New Testament Christianity. It's very clear. Uh, it's very obvious. And then by the time uh, Constantine, they were weakened enough that a, a significant percentage of them didn't have enough sense to stay away from the emperor for a number of reasons. Uh, Satan had had it well primed for Constantine. And then this guy that comes along that claims to be a Christian, even though there was no real evidence of it, no evidence of a conversion to Christ, just... Christ helped him win a battle, supposedly. That is not evidence that you're a Christian. Um, I would say Constantine was like Donald Trump, friendly toward Christians, but for his own reasons, which is typically what politicians are that are friendly toward Christianity. They are seeking to use us. And I think Constantine was seeking was looking for a way, the, the Roman Empire was in sad shape, was always fracturing uh, uh, the coups. Constantine came to power in a coup. Uh, <clears throat> there was all these civil wars going on inside uh, the empire, who was going to be the emperor. Uh, and then the palace uh, guard would overthrow the emperor because he was so bad, uh, the Praetorian guards. And uh, yeah, that's a sordid history here. But Constantine was looking for somewhere, uh, there, there was no common religion, there was no common belief system, something to unite the Roman Empire. And you know, apparently he chose Christianity. And I don't think it was anything more than a political decision. We've seen a number of presidents that have used evangelicals, uh, Bible-believing Christians, for their own purposes. Typically that's what they do. They're either openly hostile or they use us. See if they can use us. And if they're not born again, that's what they're doing because that's all they can do. There is no good in them. Uh, so, but but uh, the Constantinian Christianity that developed the the merger of of state and church. Uh, it had to accommodate the world. To work. Constantine's Christianity had to be accommodating of the world. And there was plenty of people already in the church that wanted that anyway because they weren't regenerate or they were carnal. And then, of course, when the, when the emperor embraced Christianity, a lot of people for their own individual purposes decided it would be advantageous also to be uh, on the same uh, side as the emperor. 
Uh, it will enhance your business and your political career to be a Christian. That's what happened. And then after a short reversion to paganism under one emperor, they uh, uh, Christianity became the only le uh, legal religion in the Roman Empire, which means it has to be able to accommodate everybody. So you had baptismal regeneration coming in. You had all kinds of these false doctrines. Augustine was instrumental in in creating this state, uh, non-Christian Christianity. Um, the doctrines for it, doctrinal foundations for this. And it's a mess because it, it's, it can't save you. It has orthodox doctrines generally of God and of Christ, but doctrine alone can't save you. Only God can save. Believing right doctrines aren't salvific. The Old Testament Jews that believed in Yahweh, but that didn't save them. They didn't have a personal relationship with him. None of them. They couldn't. Not even David or Abraham. Because God could not dwell in human beings. His spirit could not live in you until Christ atone for the sins of the world. Holy Spirit would be with them, but it was there was always a, a, a danger in being too familiar with God in the Old Testament because the, the issue of sin. Look like David. What happened to David? What happened to so many? Is, look at Israel when God took them out of Egypt. I mean, they, the plagues that came upon God's own people these were unregenerate. Their sins weren't atoned for. The sacrifices under the law can't actually atone for sin. They're simply uh, temporary teaching tools about atonement. They don't actually take away sin, which is what the New Testament teaches in the book of Hebrews, which is a letter written to Christian believing Christian Jews who were being pressured to go back to the law, go back to Moses. And it's about warning them you can't do that. There's nothing there for you. There's nothing there for anyone. So we need to understand, and sometimes I get a, you know, we get a glimpse perhaps of the, the radical division between the world and uh, Christ's church, the real church his people, and how wicked the world really is. It's growing ever more so. Ever, the lawlessness is exploding uh, everywhere. It's just crazy. The cops are lawless. The politicians are lawless. The, the courts are lawless. The streets are lawless. Everything's lawless right now. It's just exploding. Uh, People don't respect anything. They're just after what they can grab for themselves. No matter where you are, you see it. In Walmart, you know, the shoplifting that goes on all over the place. Some stores going out of business because they can't operate in certain areas because their shelves are just being stripped by shoplifters and the police will not enforce the law. Or they will not be allowed to enforce the law. Because everything is given over to lawlessness. It's exploding. So we, at this time especially, we must realize that, that a substitute Christianity, a superficial substitute for the real thing, for a true and personal uh, relationship with God, having been reconciled to God in Christ through faith, and that alone is the only thing that's true. Nothing else can save you. And Satan has worked to build a system of lies, and much of what's called Christianity, most of what's called Christianity, is part of that system of lies and deception to keep you from the real gospel. 
The gospel of sacramental salvation and institutional salvation is a false gospel. So everything we see out there, everything that's visible, really, is not of Christ because Christ is not visible right now, nor is the church. The true church is invisible because it consists of his people, and we're not openly. We are also veiled as Christ is. The world cannot see us, and we can't see ourselves as we truly are. When Christ returns, he will be manifest, and so shall we. But until that day, well, we have this ongoing thing, including within ourselves, with the struggle we have with our own nature, our own sinful flesh, having been born of Adam, that's still with us while we're in this mortal body. My God, we're not going to be in it eternally. That we will be conformed to the image of Christ. But this is something, if we can't understand this, this is the deception. It's like the Southern Baptists are going over to the woke. and It's just going to the world. They're just manifesting they love the world. More than they love Christ. They don't want to suffer reproach. The world is going this way, so they want to be with the world rather than with Christ. They want the approval of the world rather than being shamed for being with Christ. And I'm and but let me point out that Christians out protesting sin are not serving Christ. God did not call us to do that. Protesting sin accomplishes nothing. What are you trying to do? It is the Holy Spirit who convicts of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. You're to be out there proclaiming Christ crucified and salvation through faith in him alone. That God can save you from your wickedness. But to go out there and try to, uh, to uh, fight against sin by fighting against sin is stupid. The axe must be laid to the root of the tree. And that's only done by God in regeneration. This, you have to be cut off from the world and grafted into Christ. Anything else is not enough. Political action is worthless. It's of the world. So you're going out there and you're, you're trying to establish the kingdom of God with the tools of the world. It's insane. Irrational. Ignorant. Protesting against... It's like going into hell and protesting against the devil. I mean, the hell in the sense of his kingdom, not uh, the kingdom of Satan. See, that's what the world is. It's a kingdom of Satan. What are you doing? Jesus didn't tell us to do these things. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Make disciples from all nations. Not, to, not make the nation into a disciple. Make out of all nations, from all nations. He didn't say, build my kingdom on earth. No. Christ is building his church. You can't do it. He's the architect. He's the builder. Not you. At best, you can be his co-laborer if you follow his directions and are powered by his spirit rather than the flesh. The flesh can do no good thing. Ever. But this is something that we are so confused all the time about, and Satan loves to confuse us, and the institutional church itself is utterly confused, and part of the problem, it is of the world. It can't save you. And when it thinks it can, it's a liar. It becomes a lie. Part of Satan's lies. See, all Satan has to do is keep you away from the real gospel, from real salvation, and then he's won. 
because you don't belong to God unless God saves you. And that is only through faith in Christ and Christ alone. The only thing we can do is believe God's testimony. Respond to God's call. It's not something we initiate. It's something he does. What we can do as sinners is recognizing our lost situation. We can call out to God to save us. But he must do it. Call out to God to save us from our sin and from our the wrath of God. From our terrible condition. And when you're under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you will know you deserve hell. And that is where you're going. And then you'll realize you need a Savior. You need a Savior to save you from yourself, from what you are. If you want to go to God to get what you want, that your happy life, prosperity, this or that or whatever, God's not interested in that. He sent his son into the world to save sinners, not to coddle sinners, not to grant the wishes of sinners, but to save sinners from themselves, from what they are, lost and hellbound. So if you come to Christ, if you call out to God for that, to save you from what you are, into what you're supposed to be. To, uh, to accept the salvation he has prepared for you in Christ at great cost to himself. All who call upon the name of the Lord for that shall be saved. You're not interested in salvation from yourself, from your sin, from your wickedness. Well, you won't find it because you're not seeking it. If you're not seeking God, because only he can give that. And that's what he's promised to give to those who ask. Call upon him for it. I hope you've already done that. I hope you already have found salvation in Jesus Christ. If not, the door is still open, but it will not be open forever. Once the judge comes and takes his seat, well, it's too late. It's time for court, not grace. It's time for judgment, not salvation. Salvation is available freely until then.